Okay, so um, welcome to uh, this very special uh, SOAS Centre of Taiwan Studies uh, annual lecture. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Bruce Dixon from uh, George Washington uh, University, uh, who's here uh, giving his first ever uh, talk in the, uh, in the, in the UK. Um, those of us that uh, study Taiwan um, have, uh, are very familiar with, with Bruce's uh, work. Um, in a, a number of our Taiwan courses, we look um, at uh, his work, for example, the book Democratization uh, on uh, Taiwan and China, looking at the, the way that um, former Leninist parties uh, adapted uh, in quite different directions. Um, in our reading list, we also look at his, his work on lessons of defeat, how the KMT responded to um, uh, losing the uh, Chinese Civil War and rebuilding uh, in, uh, in Taiwan. Uh, and similarly, we look at his work in the uh, Tiananmen Mao book on uh, elections that came out around 1996, which looks at the, uh, the KMT in, um, uh, in the authoritarian uh, era. Um, now, Bruce has kind of moved away a little bit from uh, Taiwanese politics. Um, so um, what we've asked him to do today is to uh, revisit some of his earlier work. I, personally, I find this a really enjoyable process, going back to um, my, my old work. And of course, uh, the work that Bruce is going back to is his first book. Often, as academics, our first book, I think, is often our best one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I know that's a debatable one, but it's often the one that's closest uh, to our heart, and I, um, uh, at least I feel that in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in my case. Um, I should uh, say a word of thanks. Uh, uh, recently we've seen uh, improved relations between uh, Taiwan uh, and China, and we've kind of seen this uh, to a certain extent on a level at, at SOAS, because uh, this event today is, a kind of, um, is an example of cooperation between the SOAS China Centre and uh, Taiwan Centre. So uh, uh, Bruce is giving two talks at SOAS, um, and uh, us and the China Centre are kind of sharing the uh, expenses. So that's an a, uh, interesting model for uh, cross-strait uh, relations. Um, OK, so without further ado, let's go into um, uh, Bruce's talk. And we'll, uh, we'll also have, we should have a fair amount of time for Q&A, and then we've got a reception with, uh, with sandwiches uh, as well. Uh, so let's give uh, Bruce a, um, a big um, SOAS welcome. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for coming here, for coming out on a Thursday night. Uh, I know at my school, having things in the evening is always risky. Um, so having a full house here is really, really uh, quite impressive. Um, um, as... as uh, as Dr. had mentioned, uh, he had asked me to, s to reflect on um, what was my first book, and it was, um, it was, as I was preparing for this talk, I also realized that it was almost exactly 20 years ago that I had defended my dissertation. Uh, it was in March of, of 1994, and it was during the spring break for GW, and our spring break begins um, tomorrow. Um, so, as Sir Paul once said, it was 20 years ago today, and um, just sort of serendipitous that, that I'm giving this talk uh, exactly 20 years after uh, defending the dissertation. Um, and so I'm going to um, talk about a, a couple of things, both the history in terms of how this project came about uh, and why I did this comparison between uh, the ruling parties in Taiwan and China, uh, and what it was about the, the time, the context of that time that made it a uh, useful, in some ways necessary, project. Um, I'm going to look at, uh, briefly summarize the argument that I made in the book about why Taiwan democratized and why China did not, and then look at which part of the both the analysis and the predictions came from it, which ones still hold up and which ones have not held up very well. Um, and then talk about the lessons that have come about, both in terms of the lessons within China, uh, but also some of the changes within the larger international academic community uh, related to these kinds of issues. 
And one of the key themes I'm going to uh, emphasize is that um, Taiwan's democratization uh, has less and less relevance for China as we go forward. Um, and in terms of looking at the potential evolution of the CCP, uh, the experience of the KMT uh, seems to be less and less relevant for looking at its, the CCP's future uh, because the political trajectories of Taiwan and China have evolved in such different ways that how meaningful the comparison is, um, is, is not as obvious as it may have once was. Um, and certainly if we're looking at contemporary issues, the issues that China is facing today, um, uh, I'm not sure if the, how, how useful the, the comparison with Taiwan is. Uh, this is always a point of, point of contention for most China specialists. Uh, many people want to argue that China is unique and really can't be compared to anything else. Um, which I think find to be something of a non-starter in terms of looking at developing theory about China. I had a research seminar last spring, and a bunch of my grad students from China were saying, well, you really can't compare China to anything else. And I, I would say, well, why do you think civil society matters? Uh, it, it, it matters, your, your research papers on the importance of civil society in China and for coming, bringing about potential political change the reason you think it has potential for promoting political change is the experience of other countries. Uh, and so somehow theories derived from the experience of other countries seem to be OK. But doing an actual point-to-point -point comparison between China and any other country um, for different people has um, uh, problematic in, in, in different ways. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how the the, this project actually came about since it was um, uh, my dissertation and field work that went into it and then led into the book manuscript. Um, part of it had to do with the, uh, the third wave paradigm that was just becoming prominent in the early 90s when this project first got, uh, uh, got developed and, and, and carried out. Um, and this is right about when much of that literature was starting to really take hold. And, you know, Huntington's book on the third wave kind of, kind of crystallized much of that scholarship. And one of the key things was that the, the democratization of authoritarian regimes begins with a split in the leadership. And so understanding what that split is and what the interests of the different people are is key to understanding uh, why some countries do and others don't democratize. Um, and that rather than sort of making a straight line prediction about when de democratization may happen, as modernization theory was, this third wave literature was much more contingent on when it may happen, why it may happen. Uh, it wasn't much that actually producing predictable, testable hypotheses, but it was much more focusing on the very contingent nature of, of factors that lead into um, uh, the process, and it, especially in terms of uh, uh, Taiwan's democratization, both the interplay between ruling elites within the KMT, uh, the nature of the opposition and the, the, the Dong Wai movement, and the international environment uh, that, that Taiwan was part of, all had different factors that kind of crystallized at the same time to make it much more uh, possible for um, for democratization to happen. And one of, the, one of the things I learned in the process of, of my interviews that went into the field research, I had thought that this was an example of possibly of, of snowballing, that, that South Korea had democratized before that. The Philippines had, had their uh, uh, people movement that led to uh, the overthrow of the Marcos regime. And everyone I talked to in Taiwan said, no, it had nothing to do with that. We weren't really influenced by those things. What was much more important to them, though, was that the threat coming from China during the mid-80s had moderated so much that they felt more confident they could, they could initiate political reform, even if it would lead to a little bit of instability, without having to worry about China using it as a pretense to invade, um, which they had let China's leaders had laid out before. One reason they might invade <coughs> Taiwan would be political instability that threatened uh, larger, larger issues, and they, they were less worried about that given the mid-80s, given the changes that were happening within China. Um, 
Um, so it's this, these different uh, contingent issues that, that really were uh, at play that, that um, I think help explain why uh, Taiwan democratized the way it did, but also why those things were lacking in, in, in China's case and therefore um, had not and has not yet led to a similar outcome. Um, why compare China and Taiwan in the first place? Uh, on the one hand, there's major differences between China and Taiwan. Obviously, the size difference, so much, uh, Taiwan's a much smaller piece of territory, a much smaller population. Um, uh, then, as now, different levels of development. Uh, the ethnic makeup, which is so much a part of the dynamics of Taiwan politics, uh, is simply lacking in China. China has its own uh, ethnic problems, but not in the same way that Taiwan does. Um, the, the mainlander versus Taiwanese uh, division uh, has no corollary uh, in Chinese politics. Um, <coughs> it was key to the political developments during the martial law period. Um, it was key to the transitions, key to politics now, but um, doesn't have an immediate uh, counterpoint within China. Um, but there are a couple of good reasons to, to do the comparison. One was, at least at the time, they were both Leninist parties. And uh, it was both going back to the 1920s, uh, when Sun Yat-sen had, had reorganized the KNT with Soviet advisors and created sort of a, a, sort of a classic Leninist regime, a Leninist party. Uh, once the KNT had lost the Civil War and retreated to Taiwan, uh, went through a period of reorganization to kind of revive some of those earlier organizational features didn't call them Leninists because that was would be unacceptable, uh, but it was nonetheless uh, a typical type of, well, I won't, I won't call it typical, it was an unusual type of Leninist party given the other aspects of, of, uh, of Taiwan. And that there were similarities in just that they were both coming out of the same political culture. Um, and both uh, parties had formed roughly around the same time. Uh, they had a lot of interaction earlier in their, their development. Um, in different ways, had learned from each other. Uh, when KMT had moved to Taiwan uh, in the late 40s, and John Kai-shek had, had launched a study about why they ended up there instead of ruling China, uh, one of the things that he, conclusions he came to was that the CCP was simply better at organization than the KMT was. Uh, so if it wanted to defeat them, it had to emulate some of those features. Um, so there are key differences between them, but also, you know, since I'm looking at whether or not Leninist parties are able to adapt uh, and democratize, then the comparisons seem to um, be at least plausible. Um, the, the context of the time was also significant. In the early 1990s when this was being done, and my field work was in 1991, um, this was soon after the, the 1989 demonstrations in Tiananmen Square and elsewhere in China. Uh, the immediate, years immediately after that were not really good times to study the potential for political reform in China. Uh, and so actually going there and doing any type of research, interviewing anything, on this topic just seemed to be a non-starter. Um, so initially, the comparison with Taiwan was going to be more, more secondary. The focus was going to be on China. Taiwan was going to be more of a shadow case, uh, but there kind of as, a, as a counterpoint. Uh, but as it turned out, it ended up being really sort of a 50-50 uh, comparison between the, the two, uh, between the KMT and the CCP. Um, for one reason, it was just so much easier to do research in Taiwan than it was uh, than it is uh, in China. Um, I was able to have interviews with former prime ministers, heads of the organization department because they ran elections, um, uh, chiefs of staff to the president. It was just amazing how easy it was to, to get research done. And part of it, uh, uh, Tian Hongmao was sort of my unofficial advisor. And, and having him write letters for me 
opened doors so fast. Um, <coughs> because I was coming from University of Michigan, Mike Oxenberg was my main advisor. <coughs> he was not a beloved figure in Taiwan. Because uh, he was President Jimmy Carter's China specialist when the U.S. broke ties with Taiwan and established relations with China. And so he was seen as just the devil. Uh, so having him as my advisor wasn't very helpful. Um, <laughs> having uh, Ten Hong out you know, <coughs> write letters for me, got me grant money, it got me access to people. It was just amazing. And he had no reason. To, I had never met him before. He agreed to do this. He was just an incredibly generous guy. Um, and it couldn't have been done, done without him. The only area where doing research in Taiwan was difficult was using the KMT archives. Um, this is the pre-digital era in the early 1990s. So it's, it's in this remote, um, it's you know, at the top of Yangmingshan in, in, in Taipei City. So I first go there, and they give you a um, binder of all the topics they have that you might be interested in. And it's broken down by time period. So I'm looking at it and there's stuff about party recruitment and there's party government relations and there's party building and society. This is gonna be great, it's exactly what I'm looking for. And you go to the card catalog and you pull it out, it's empty. Um, and I was, you know, and uh, finally the head of the archives said, we have all those things, but they're in boxes in the back because it's so politically sensitive. They can't get permission to actually um, organize it, categorize it, and make it available. So they have it, you just can't see it. And so, you know, knowing it was there, better just say, no, it, it got burned when we left the mainland. That would have been better, you know. <laughs> Knowing it was there, but I didn't have access to it was, was terribly frustrating. Uh, it was one of the reasons why every time I'd go, go up there, I would get this terrible headache. Um, both because of the stress of, of being up there, but also they, they told me it was a higher elevation. That, that was part of the, part of the uh, uh, reason for it. But anyway, so. What was happening in China in the 1990s was a key part of, of why I did my field work in Taiwan. I did so much more in six months in Taiwan than I ever could have done uh, in China that, that I was uh, delighted to have, have the opportunity. Um, let me kind of quickly summarize the argument and then talk about how much of it still is valid. Uh, the argument that I made was that uh, Taiwan's democratization was in Huntington's terms, a elite-led transformation. In other words, it was the ruling party during the authoritarian era, the KMT, that initiated and sponsored the process of democratization. Um, other people argue it's more of a societal-led uh, transition, uh, with more emphasis on the Dong Wai than, than I did. Uh, and there's clearly elements of both uh, the KMT was opening, but uh, the Dong Wai was pushing, and so there's, there's obviously uh, both parts are, are, are relevant there, but in terms of looking at the role of a ruling party in initiating a transition, and in the KMT's point, surviving that transition, uh, focusing on its motivations, the, the key leaders, and what they're hoping to achieve, and what they did achieve uh, was essential. Uh, and also proved useful for looking at the potential for democratization in China. Um, there's a couple key factors that I argued were uh, crucial to understanding why the KMT was willing and able to initiate democratization. One was, was the role of ideology, that in the KMT and the ROC constitution, the commitment to democracy was there. Uh, and so what they were doing was consistent with their own provisions. They had been put on hold for a while because the opportunity wasn't ripe for that kind of a arrangement. But they could legitimize it by both talking about their own constitution as well as uh, Sun Yat-sen previously, uh, democracy being a key part of the three principles of the people. Uh, these things were not really relevant for the CCP. Uh, there's nothing in, in the party's history that would allow it to make a transition 
uh, and legitimize it by referencing that democracy was part of its ideology from, from the very beginning. Uh, more recently, there have been vague pled pledges about future democratization in, in China, but always with the provision that it won't be a Western-style democracy, it will be something else, um, but, but not a lot of flesh, uh, a lot of detail on what that would actually entail. Uh, elections were a, another key aspect, both local elections uh, beginning in the 1970s, mostly in the 70s, also a little bit earlier, and the occasional supplemental elections for the legislative yuan um, provide a useful source of feedback for the KMT in terms of what public opinion was toward the party uh, and how they were doing in one election to the next. Uh, it was both also information for the opposition in terms of how much support they might have um, and what types of messages were successful and which ones were not. Uh, it was a key avenue for participation, so both the Dong Wai didn't, wasn't just left with street protests and demonstrations, it could channel activity into legitimate political institutions um, that kind of gave it a purpose and gave it a direction. Um, and again, these things missing in China. Uh, there are village elections, village elections in China, um, nowhere near as important um, as a source of feedback, and nowhere near as important as a source of participation by people who want to challenge the CCP. Uh, the opportunities to be a truly independent candidate um, are usually, I don't want to say they're non-existent, but they're very heavily um, uh, limited um, by uh, by the party to either allow them to be candidates or to acknowledge their victory should they actually win an election. Uh, so, so elections had a prominent role over a long period of time in Taiwan. Uh, they largely stalled out of China as a source of further political change. Uh, for a while, there's a whole topic <coughs> industry about studying village elections in China. Um, and I think it's sort of reached the point of diminishing returns now. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot left to learn, and the, the elections themselves have not progressed to make, oops, make it a source of ongoing, sorry about that, uh, source of activity. Um, and the role of elites was also essential. Um, and this is why looking at the KMT was, was so important, that uh, in a curious way, uh, Zhang Jinghua was both the patron of the hardliners and he was the patron of the reformers. Uh, and he had, both of them were sources of support, both of them saw him as their key voice. Uh, but by the mid 80s, uh, other hardliners had been uh, pushed out of key positions, in some cases pushed out of the country, uh, his own son being one of them. Uh, and more reform oriented people like Mind Joe were now his, his key advisors. Um, and so, at this key juncture, the people who were most prominent within the KMT were themselves advocates of further democratization and further reform. Um, the, um, again, so using um, Huntington's terminology, but not, not quite the same diagram, when you have soft liners in an authoritarian party, um, and the opposition is relatively moderate, that's the ideal condition under which a smooth democratization could, can occur. And that was the condition of the mid 80s uh, in Taiwan. So the, the conditions were pretty fortuitous for the type of democratization that took place there. Um, other combinations <coughs> make it much less likely that you would have a successful transition, or any transition for that matter. Um, within the CCP, um, there's not been a similar willingness by any of the top leaders to actually um, promote uh, wide-ranging political reforms as took place with the lifting of martial law in Taiwan back in 1986. Um, even the notion of hardliners and softliners isn't usually how we talk about China's, you know, factional differences within the CCP. You know, we talk about uh, elitists, populists, princelings, uh, but in some sense, 
they all seem to be hardliners. Uh, except for former Prime Minister Wen Jiabao, there isn't really anyone who's talking seriously about, about the, the promise of, of democracy in, in the near future. Um, so just even the, the terminology that was used as part of the third wave literature doesn't really seem to help us understand the dy dynamics within China. Even the discussion of constitutional government has been a banned topic. Uh, because it is seen as a um, as symbolizing discussion about democratic change without saying so explicitly, um, and so even the discussion and publication of, of uh, on this topic has been uh, limited in in recent years, um, and there's no dynamic similar to uh, Taiwanization in China. Uh, in terms of co-opting people into the party, bringing their interests in, and then having them transform the party. Uh, there isn't a similar social group like that in China that has the potential to kind of reorient the party and its, its focus on the types of interests it wants to pursue. Um, so the various things that led to a smooth, successful transition in Taiwan each of those elements are missing. So at least in terms of you know, how relevant or what China can learn from the Taiwan experience, or as we as outside analysts, what the Taiwan experience can tell us about what to expect in China, since China is missing all the things, or the CCP is missing the things that let the KMT do what it did, um, uh, gives us pause about being terribly, uh, gives me pause for being very optimistic about the potential for democratization uh, anytime soon. Uh, what, what things have held up uh, from, from the analysis and the predictions that come out of it? Uh, one of them is ethnicity is still the main driver of, uh, or a key driver of politics in Taiwan. Um, in the, even the period after democratization, um, the KMT split during the Li Donghui era was largely about ethnicity uh, and about his more uh, a stronger push for uh, Taiwanese identity and independence for Taiwan, uh, leading to the formation of the new party uh, during the 90s. Uh, it's still the source of uh, many elections, and, and the supporters for the KMT and the DPP is still largely about identity issues. It's not the only issue, and in fact, both parties um, when they promote identity issues, when the DPP really promotes Taiwan, in, Taiwan independence, when the KMT, did I get that wrong? When the DPP promotes Taiwan independence, when the KMT pronounce, identifies its sort of mainland perspective, they don't do well in elections. It's when they kind of focus more on domestic issues, on, on social justice, on public policy issues, more moderate kinds of issues, that's when they do better. But there's still that, that division uh, there's still the suspicion of people like President Ma that he really intends to sell out Taiwan in order to achieve unification. There's that suspicion that it simply won't die. Uh, and so uh, it still remains a, a, key, a, a key part. Um, and I just want to um, point out the symbolism that I made a point of not wearing anything blue or green. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not picking sides. Um, so, uh, but, but nevertheless, that is still the, the difference between uh, deep and light, blue and green, uh, is still a useful framework for understanding what's happening in Taiwan. Um, second thing that that's, uh, has held up is the CCP's opposition to democratization. Uh, it's liberalized in a variety of ways, uh, but has, you know, it's sort of intolerant and, and uh, dismissive of, of other desires to actually democratize. Um, <coughs> in some ways, China is more open today, certainly compared to the early 1990s when I was doing my research, China is much more open now than it was then. Uh, it lacks the kind of freedoms that we take for granted living in democratic societies. But given their own past, uh, it's, it's more open than, than it has been. And that's, that's part of the, the uh, dichotomy of, of really understanding what's happening within China, is that at a 
if you're looking at it as a snapshot, it doesn't compare well with other countries that are democratic in a variety of ways. If you look at it over a longer period of time, a couple of decades, a couple of generations, uh, the, the, the changes that have taken place over the past 15, 20 years have been enormous, but they haven't resulted in anything that looks like democratization or should even be understood in terms of that, but nevertheless a freer society than uh, would have been the case in the past. Movement away from that in the last couple of years, but nevertheless, over a longer period of time, uh, important changes that, that are often not fully recognized by people who don't study, study China. What has not held up? Uh, most importantly, I don't know anyone who would describe the KMT today as a Leninist party. Uh, whatever it, origins it may have had have, have long been abandoned. Uh, the key features that we think of Leninism to organizational features uh, are simply missing. Democratization has meant the end of traditional party building, party recruitment, party government relations. That, that's just not, not relevant. Uh, and so its evolution since the 1980s makes the KMT a much different party than what it used to be. And the comparison with the CCP is now much more tenuous than it was leading up to democratization. So I mentioned at the beginning, one of the key themes that, that came to me as I was thinking about uh, reflecting on, on the study uh, is that now it would be harder to do a comparison. It would be harder to do it. It would be harder to be convincing that it was a worthwhile comparison, given how different they've become over the past uh, now almost 30 years. Um, <coughs> Second of all, uh, I think state society relations in China are not what they look like back in the early 1990s. Um, impo most importantly, it's not clear how strong the support for democracy is within China. Um, leading up to the 18th Party Congress in 2012, a, lo a lot of the media reporting was about you know, the people of China have become impatient with reform, they're fed up with the party, fed up with corruption, the party had lost legitimacy. Um, on the other hand, there's been no social movement in China since 1989 uh, advocating for democracy. The many protests that we see rarely are about broader political issues. They're usually about very specific and usually material kinds of issues. Uh, public opinion surveys, going back as far as um, you know, even in the early 2000s, the Asian barometer surveys, um, most people in China think the country is becoming more and more democratic. Um, but they don't define it in terms of elections, competitive parties, rule of law, the things that we think of as being essential to democracy. Uh, it's much more about having the government do things in the people's interest. Um, or to um, uh, allow more freedom, as I mentioned just a minute ago. These are the things they see, that China is more democratic now than it used to be, and they anticipate it becoming even more democratic in the very near future, but it's not a type of democracy that normally would be how we would define it. Uh, but if they see the country becoming more democratic, then the dissidents in the country who are calling for more democracy, the foreign governments who put pressure on China to become more democratic, the public is, their reaction is, why are these people making such a big fuss about it? You know, it's more and more open now than it used to be. What are these people talking about? Um, and so there's sort of a disconnect between sort of the international discourse on democracy and the way in which people in China <coughs> tend to see it uh, in their own lives. Um, a third thing that is, has held up is, has not held up is the party's unwillingness to engage in political reform. Um, in the book, I, I made a distinction between uh, efficient adaptation, in which the party is trying to revise and reform itself in ways to more effectively implement its agenda, uh, and distinguish that from a responsive type of adaptation where the party's <coughs> agenda is changing because of public opinion. Um, and in many ways, it's still focused, the CCP is still focused more on, e on efficient types of adaptations. 
how can they draw in some uh, insight from society before adopting major policies to help implement it uh, or get a better sense about what would be acceptable and what's not. Um, before the, the health care reform of 2009 was, was rolled out, uh, before the labor law of a few years before that was implemented, there's a long period of public comment through the internet, uh, many times from, from specialists, healthcare professionals, doctors, health, uh, hospital administrators, giving input on what the new healthcare system should look like. Um, local budget deliberations about what the priorities of government should be for the coming year. Uh, these are things that don't get a lot of attention in the foreign media, but are important at the local level, uh, at least in limited ways in, in, cer in certain uh, key issue areas. Now these trends have to be balanced against the often tone-deaf nature of the top leaders about truly uh, bringing the voice of the people into the policy-making process, but often locally or on specific national issues, there has been much more liberalization than is often recognized um, so it, I don't want to exaggerate how much reform there has been, but I also don't want to ignore the fact that there are key examples of innovation and reform that have taken place, uh, none of which amount to democratization, as I mentioned before, but are no, no less important in their own sake. So like the photo here, uh, the picture of political reform in China is kind of fuzzy. Uh, exactly what the party's intentions are. Uh, but it has been willing to initiate and sponsor some reforms, uh, just hoping that they don't create expectations of even more ambitious reforms that may come, come later. Um, in, you know, as, as, uh, when, we're, when we're writing, we're always encouraged to make a very strong argument and not do that. Well, on the one hand, but on the other hand, yeah, was, you, you want to have a a takeaway line. So I really emphasize the fact that the CCP had no potential for further adaptation. Um, and that was overstated the case. Um, and it's, it's, the party has proven to be far more adaptive, I think, than was apparent in the early 1990s. Um, in, I guess it was around <coughs> 2001 or so, when Andy Nathan has an article on authoritarian resilience, which really crystallized what a lot of people had come to uh, understand about the nature of political reform in China. Uh, having it come from him made it much more legitimate because he was seen as someone who up until that time had been a strong advocate of, of democracy in China, um, was on the, um, could not get a visa to go to China because of his advocacy for his testimony in Congress. So when he writes about authoritarian resilience in the sense that, that here's a party that is adapting in very specific ways that in fact make the system work better, it carries more weight than when it ha other people might say the same thing. Um, so there's been some backtracking in recent years, uh, but I think in many ways the, the regime is uh, firmly in place, doesn't face immediate challenge the way that, that uh, often brought about democratization for other former third wave uh, cases. Uh, soon after the 89 demonstrations, uh, the guy who was the U.S. ambassador to China at the time, Winston Lord, um, said that um, the, the lifespan of the People's Republic would not be measured in days or weeks. No, it would not, be, would not be measured in months or years, it'd be measured in days or weeks. Um, and he was obviously completely wrong. It's been measured in decades. Um, and so um, that may be one reason why you don't see him in the news as a consultant about uh, what's going on more recently. Okay, let me talk about some of the lessons that, that come out of, of all of this. Uh, begin with the popular perspectives within China. Um, I found that Taiwan's democratization has not had a big impact on popular thinking about political reform in China. Uh, there's, there's sort of a curiosity in the fact that there were elections in, in Taiwan for president and there are competitive, competitive elections and all that kind of stuff, but 
they just don't see as really relevant to their situation. So they're sort of curious about it, but not really inspired by it. Um, they're certainly <coughs> amused by it, especially these uh, numerous photos and videos of fights uh, among politicians in Taiwan. Uh, and for that matter, these are the kinds of images that sort of uh, diminish popular, uh, the popular appeal of democracy in, in China. If this is what democracy is, you know, who needs it? Um, um, in a similar way, the, and I'll take a step back, when I talk to scholars in China, <coughs> ta Taiwan's experience doesn't really seem to matter. I mean, you, you would think that here's an alternative, another type of, another type of China dream, right? Uh, here's another way that you can, a Chinese society can be governed. Um, it, it just doesn't seem to be pretty interesting, at least to the stars that I talk to. So it, it hasn't really had ongoing ripple effects to change the way with people within China think about the potential for change. Uh, I have not, well, I have met a few people in the Politburo, never had a one-on-one -on -one interview to ask them, what do you think about Taiwan? Uh, but the fact that um, in Taiwan and South Korea, former presidents go to jail when they leave office uh, cannot be something that makes them fond of the idea of implementing democracy uh, with, within their country. Um, this is one thing for, one of the lessons from, from third wave democracies, it's more likely if the elites don't feel threatened by what will happen after the transition. Uh, and so the fact that, uh, that they probably had no sympathy at all for Century of going to jail. Um, but the fact that it did happen probably gives them pause about what may happen to them if they were to uh, democratize the country. Um, some international perspectives. Um, this, this, is, this would be fun, to, I think, during the Q&A to, to see if, uh, how much people agree with this. I would say on the one hand, if China does democratize, <coughs> Um, it will not improve the chances for Taiwan's independence. Um, that the notion of giving up territory is so abhorrent to most um, intellectuals and, and, the, and the average people that I know, it's unlikely they'd be more willing to tolerate independence for Taiwan if the country democratized. Uh, many new democracies often have very nationalistic leaders and nationalism can be used as a source of legitimacy for new leaders. Um, China's already pretty nationalistic. Um, so if it were to ramp up after a change, uh, it would not be particularly um, helpful to the cause of Taiwan's independence. Uh, a number of years ago, the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington, uh, which is the organization that publishes the Journal of Democracy and has a lot of, of advocacy issues on democratic issues, um, thought it would bring together Chinese dissidents who had emigrated from the country and Tibetans uh, because they both had issues in freedom and reform and so on and they, they met and there was simply no common ground whatsoever because even the Chinese dissidents who had left the country believed that Tibet was part of China. Um, and we're not about to give up control over, over the country. And, and there's simply no, despite their philosophical opposition to the current regime, had nothing else in common. Um, and so it, it was just a dead end. Uh, and so, you know, that's why I say if China does democratize, that won't really help the cause of Taiwan independence, at least in creating support for it within China. Uh, in a different way, if China were to become democratic, I think the international support for Taiwan would evaporate almost immediately. Because um, what there has been support for Taiwan's status quo is the desire to prevent an authoritarian regime taking over uh, 25 million <coughs> people who have been living in a, in a democracy for a generation or so. Um, but if China became democratic, that's not an issue anymore. Um, it is an issue for people who support Taiwan's independence, uh, 
But for the international community, who doesn't really care a whole lot about Taiwan independence, um, this would give, give them an out to no longer stand up for Taiwan in different ways. Uh, even within the American <coughs> Congress, which the Congress has usually been more supportive of Taiwan than the White House, um, uh, going back to Nixon. I, the number of people during the turnover of younger people coming into Congress, uh, none of them really have a stake in Taiwan the way older people, uh, more veteran senators and congressmen did. Uh, it's very difficult to get them focused on the Taiwan issue or care much about it. Uh, there's so many other issues involved in U.S.-China relations, whether trade, security, cybersecurity, human rights, those are much more prominent. The Taiwan issue is sort of fading as an issue that, that really animates American politicians. And the fact that cross-strait relations have been improving so much uh, over the past six, seven years also makes it easier for it to slide off the radar for, for American politicians. Um, this is also true among scholars. Um, much of the, what's made the biggest splash, at least in the US, in the last couple of years were two articles in Foreign Affairs, one by Bruce Gilley, uh, where he advocated, he advised Taiwan to adopt the Finland model uh, from the Cold War. Uh, in order to be allowed to be independent, it will basically surrender its foreign policy and its aspirations for a more independent status. That he, he thought this, this is the, the best alternative for them. And of course, it just led to a firestorm of reaction, uh, being presumptuous for a Canadian to tell, good thing it was a Canadian, for a Canadian <laughs> to tell Taiwan's leaders what they should do. Uh, my colleague at GW, uh, Charlie Glazer, recently wrote in Foreign Affairs, he, he's a hardcore realist. Um, but his <coughs> argument was, what's most likely to have China and the US go to war would be a conflict over Taiwan. So the US should simply give up its even implied commitment to Taiwan's defense. So that won't be an issue in the US-China relationship. Um, good thing he wasn't a China specialist. You know, so Gilly was a Canadian, you can forgive him. Uh, <laughs> Laser is a realist, and of course he thinks in terms of these ways. But there have not been a lot of people, a lot of American scholars who've been doing much work on Taiwan. There have been a few very prominent ones. Um, Shelley Rigger is probably the, the most well-regarded and well-known. Uh, people like Alan Walkman and Scott Kastner uh, have also done uh, good work, but they're sort of more at the fringe. Um, not real well-known um, within the academic circles uh, in the U.S. But the people who actually do what my book had done, and a real comparison between China and Taiwan, only one I can think of now is Ben Reed, uh, who does work on homeowners associations in Beijing and, and Taipei. Homeowners associations is not exactly an agenda setting topic <laughs> within political science. Um, it's a very almost, it's, it's not unpolitical, but it's really about how homeowners interact with their associations to, to protect their interests as homeowners, not how they interact with the state to get things done. So he's done the more recent work on this, but it's sort of uh, not a political issue having to do with reform in any ways. Um, most people, most of the younger generation of scholars, and I'm, uh, I'm gonna say anyone younger than me is a younger generation of scholars in the US, most of them don't have any personal experience. People older than me, many of them went to Taiwan to do language study or to do research. Um, Young, younger scholars have had opportunities to go to China to do language study and to do their research. And it's, we have grants at GW to send people to Taiwan to do language study, and they usually go unclaimed because people don't want to go to Taiwan. This, this is, I'm sorry, uh, this is probably wrong for this is At GW, there's much more of an interest, and I think more generally in American universities, much more interest in going to China to do language study because you get the full experience. Uh, language instruction is still better in Taiwan, uh, but 
but <coughs> people are going not just for that reason, but they want the full experience. And um, even for that, you know, the flagship program for language study migrated from National Taiwan University to Tsinghua. So even the program realized where the market was going, where the customers were going. Um, and I think it's, it's just, even among academics, there's less of a real interest or real knowledge of, of contemporary Taiwan, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, and I have to admit, it, as, as Dafei mentioned earlier, after this first book, I, you know, I kind of follow it in the newspaper or read occasional article, but it hasn't been a key part of my research either, because my real question was, what are the prospects for the CCP? The KMT was an important window onto that. That's still a question I'm still asking. What is prospects for the CCP to lose power, to hang on to power? How does it do so? Um, come back tomorrow and you'll hear about that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but those questions are not as, as easily answered by looking at what's happened in Taiwan in the years afterwards. Um, so we're going to sum up here. Um, the argument that I made in the book that the CP, CCP was unlikely to follow the KMT's example, I think, is still uh, is still true. That if China does democratize, it's less likely to be a party-led initiative than a bottom-up um, societal-led movement. Um, Bruce Gilley has the opposite view. He thinks that democratization will happen when when reform-oriented elites emerge within the party to carry it out. Um, uh, we, uh, he and I agreed that in the short run, I'm right, but in the long run, we both hope that he's right. Um, <laughs> because elite-led transformations tend to be more peaceful, um, but they also run the risk of not actually becoming democracy. Um, which is the next point, uh, which was not apparent at the time. When, when the third wave literature first was underway, the idea that you would have authoritarian, a, a transition from one authoritarian regime to another authoritarian regime wasn't really obvious back in the late 80s, early 90s. But in more recent examples, you know, think of the Arab Spring, think of the post-Soviet Russia, Ukraine more recently. Um, the alternative to the CCP rule in China is not necessarily democracy. Uh, and so the more that the elites trigger the transition, I would argue the less likely you get a full democratization um, as, a, as a result. Um, 20 years ago, at, at the defense of, of my dissertation, uh, one of my advisors, uh, Marty White, who's a sociologist now at Harvard, uh, ended by saying, I better get the book published before the CCP calls for national elections, uh, which would undermine everything that, 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 that the book had, had laid out. Um, so 20 years later, I can still say that prediction <coughs> has held up. Um, but I also have to admit that I check the paper every day to see, because, you know, it's often, it's easier to explain what happened. It's very, very difficult to know which of the trends underway now are the primary ones, and which will, in fact, be important in the near future. Uh, so I always check, but at least as of today, um, it hasn't happened. So um, in that sense, um, I don't want... It's almost sad to say that it has held up for 20 years, um, but, but it has. So uh, with that, I'll stop and take your questions and, and comments. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're right that personal experience is so important for, for why many of us um, have studied Taiwan, particularly in, in that period of time. I mean, I think that Shirley Rieger was, uh, I think she would have been doing her field work around that kind of time. I know I, I personally first went to Taiwan as a language student in 89, 90, 
and then lived in Taiwan in 92 to 99. So um, <coughs> that has a huge impact on our, our research uh, direction. Uh, a lot of it is accidental. Um, and one of the other things I picked up from, uh, from your talk and from speaking to a lot of uh, Americans is a kind of a sense of pessimism about the study of Taiwan these days in the US. Uh, although we, we seem to feel there's a, quite a different uh, mood um, in this kind of field in, in, in Europe. I think there's been a, a lot of work, particularly on Taiwanese um, uh, politics. But I think you're right, very few people are still doing the um, China-Taiwan comparison. I mean, Julia Strauss is doing it, but comparing the 1950s. Yeah. Um, I mean, one um, uh, question I wanted to, to raise was you talked about um, the impact of, uh, or the image of Taiwan's democracy in, um, um, in the PRC. Um, um, and it's generally quite, quite uh, negative, this image of, of chaos, instability, parliamentary violence, um, Taiwan independence. But to what extent has that image improved uh, since the people that the CCP want to win have been winning? They've had a little bit more success since 2008. Has that not um, cropped up in, in conversations? <coughs> Um, you know, it really hasn't. I, but I have to admit that when I, my conversations are more about, you know, reform in China, local local issues of governance, <coughs> and that kind of thing. And there hasn't been a specific reference to, you know, is experience of Taiwan relevant for these kinds of things? Um, when I remember last summer when I was um, when I was in China last spring. It was right at the time that it was announced that President Obama and President Xi were going to have this special retreat in California together. Um, and the argument that I got from a number of people, both in uh, um, all academics, but the argument was this was the, it was necessary to do it now because eventually there would be some explosion in the relationship. The president would meet the Dalai Lama, uh, the U.S. would announce a new batch of arms sales, and Taiwan, or China would have to uh, retaliate and overreact. And they, they were saying as though this is largely theater, but, mm. but they would have to overreact to it. And so even they were not saying it was particularly they just saw it as another complication in an otherwise fraught relationship, um, but not as something that you know China had a potential to learn from or should learn from. Um, these are people who most were studying U.S.-China relations, so in that sense, maybe they weren't the right people. Right. Um, but I, I have to say, it hasn't really come up in conversations that has really stuck in my memory. Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, Charles uh, and, Mike, and Michael. Yeah, go ahead, Charles. Uh, well, Professor Dixon, thank you for your presentation, which is very thoughtful and insightful uh, for me. And I uh, agree with you uh, on your observation <coughs> on uh, the KMT's change over the uh, past few decades, and which is significant and important. And I also agree with you that uh, we cannot apply this model uh, directly um, or uh, completely uh, to the uh, CCP's future. Um, but uh, from my experience, I think probably there are two uh, experiences that KMT has gone through could be inspiring to uh, the CCP in the future. I think uh, the first one is the motive motivation to, 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 to go democratization. Because you, you see, in uh, uh, before 1980s, uh, the KMT was regarded as an uh, authoritarian uh, regime, but uh, uh, the KMT delivered uh, well, economic growth uh, with so-called Taiwan Miracle. And that was the legitimacy of the KMT's uh, regime in Taiwan. But in, in well, late 80s and early 90s, the economic growth cannot uh, be sustained, and the economic growth rate, well, uh, down less than uh, 5%. So KMT gradually uh, lost its legitimacy uh, uh, in terms of economics. 
So that's the time that KMT will have to find another what source of legitimacy. So the uh, democracy became uh, again this uh, uh, the uh, another source to to collect its uh, legitimacy. So I would think this kind of legitimacy change or shift could be something that the CP CCP will have to to encounter in the next uh, decade. Um, the the second point I think uh, probably the the CCP will have to learn is that. 30 years ago, we won't say that the, uh, the KMT in Taiwan is a democratic party, but now we say KMT is totally a campaign machine. So you can see it's totally different. Right. And two years ago, when I was called back and to be the spokesperson of the KMT, I found that, wow, I didn't have a deep relationship with the KMT, but they asked me to go back and to be the face of the party. Wow, it's different. And so you can see the KMT has done very hard to transform itself. And that's, I think that's exactly the CCP will have to learn. How to turn an authoritarian party into a campaign machine, which can uh, well, do uh, the, uh, uh, good in, in elections. So that's two points I think probably the CCP will have to learn. And I want to have your opinion on this. And may I have a second question? <laughs> may I, can we go, uh, go back to the, oh, okay. Okay. Right, okay. <laughs> the second round later? Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, um, I, on the one hand, you're right that there are problems the party is facing that could be, that could help re-legitimize itself if it, if it went in that direction. The problem is that Moving towards democracy, I think, would not necessarily <coughs> legitimize the CCP. Um, it would make it more difficult for it to really manage the transition the, the way the KMT did. Because the KMT always said, we are a democracy. No one really believed it, but it kept saying that. Right? <laughs> and so now it was actually carrying it out. And, it, and for the CCP to say, they talk about it being um, uh, you know, inter-party democracy and, and so on, but, but it's really for people in the party. It's not really meant for society more generally. Um, and if it were to give up its status as, as the only legitimate political party, leaving aside the eight so-called democratic parties, but the, it has a monopoly on political power. If it were to relax that, my guess is that it would in fact not re-legitimize the party it would open up space for all kinds of other parties to form. Uh, so in the process, it would just get bulldozed, or, or <coughs> is that a word? It, it, it would get run over by its own by its own initial step. And I think that's been the issue about what has really prevented the CCP from actually carrying out more ambitious political reforms, because it knows that whenever it does society sees it as, a, as an, a rare opportunity to make its voice heard, and then it has a, t a potential for destabilizing and really threatening the regime as a whole. So better to not even let that discussion get started because it doesn't know how it's going to end up. Uh, so I, for that reason, I think even, this is where I think Gilly is wrong, that even if there were people <coughs> on the top of the party who wanted to democratize, they would have a much harder time having it evolve the way they wanted it to. Taiwan already had elections. It already had institutions. It just had to change, in fundamental ways, change how those elections were run, who could run in them, uh, which seats were open to election. But the institutions were pretty much there. Uh, you'd have to create the state from, not from scratch, but you really have to fundamentally change not just how people get elected, but, but who does the voting, who organize, who, which parties are on. It, it, it's much more complicated. The CCP this, um, has been so successful at preventing any type of organized opposition that that makes it so much harder for a transition to happen. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Taiwan, KMT knew who the opposition was. They were already pretty well organized. They didn't have, they weren't allowed to <coughs> establish a 
party, but when the KMT wanted to talk to the opposition about how to move forward, it knew who to talk to. Mm -hmm. It's not clear who the CCP would talk to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that makes it, they've been so successful at repressing those voices, it's not clear who they could talk to if they want to manage transition. <coughs> so I, I think, that's why I think that the context is so very different once you get past kind of surface similarities. Okay, right, uh, Mike. Um, yeah, I wonder if you could give examples from the uh, post-Cold War European history of the difference between an elite-led transformation and, and what is not elite-led. I mean, it seems there's a whole baffling variety of things. I mean, the Gorbachev change would have been elite-led, I suppose. Whereas Václav Havel and Czech Republic was not elite in, in that sense. And other places that we don't hear about in the news, like Romania, um, how would you characterize some of these? I'm going way outside my realm, limited realm of expertise, but I'm happy to dive in. Um, I think the <coughs> countries, the, the post-communist countries that have had the most successful transitions to democracy have two things in common. One, the closer you are to Western Europe, the more likely you were to have a transition to democracy. Because you had uh, European countries and later the EU encouraging you to come this way. And there was economic reward for, for doing so. But you also had opposition figures like Havel is the best example of this in Czechoslovakia. Um, Poland was also an example of a bottom-up transfer. The military tried to negotiate with solidarity, but it was clear it didn't need to. The solidarity didn't need to negotiate with the military. It was going to take over. Um, other, but the fact is that you had Gorbachev's reforms that, that crashed and burned. Uh, what Yeltsin did initially looked like it was moving in that direction, but it didn't get very far, and then everything that he did during the 90s <laughs> had been eliminated since then. Um, People in China look at Russia and the transition that happened there after the end of communism and said, you can keep it. We don't want anything like that. I mean, because savings were destroyed, life expectancy dropped by about a decade. Uh, it has a type of repressive, uh, not just political repressive, but also high rates of crime that generally China does not have. People in China sort of recognize the limits of what they've got, but they also see progress in a whole bunch of areas that are not exist, don't exist in Russia. Um, and so they don't, they see both the party leaders um, and I think society more generally sees Russia as what to avoid. Um, and better to let things kind of percolate along as they are, not push for something dramatic right now. Okay, yeah, uh, Raymond. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Professor Dixon. Um, um, you mentioned about uh, <coughs> uh, a lot of, I would say, uh, less positive sort of impact of uh, Taiwanese uh, political development on many China. I think, in my personal experience, um, talking to people in many China, that might be true um, and, uh, in the early years. However, I think uh, after we've seen the peaceful and smooth changeover of power, from say KMT to you know uh, DPP and then back to KMT, I think in a way the positive image of Taiwanese politics I think uh, now is more uh, I would say more prominent, uh, prominent than, than before. Uh, my question to you uh, is actually in China um, is widely believed that the democracy in Taiwan was very much down to one person, Jiang Jingwu. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's him lifting the you know the the martial law and also the uh, ban on political parties. Well, now we have a new leader, Yi Xin Jinping. Um, in your crystal ball, do you believe uh, that uh, Xi Jinping could be Jiang Jingguo equivalent in China <laughs> to change the <laughs> democracy? Um, 
No. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, China's leaders, this is true for, for uh, Hu Jintao, and it's also true for Xi Jinping. You don't get ahead in the Chinese political system by being politically innovative. You know, in the United States, we like mavericks in, in our political system. You don't get very far if you're a maverick in, in China. Uh, and so for both, you know, for, for Hu Jintao, he spent 10 years where it's clear he was going to be the next leader. And so his goal was to say nothing and do nothing that would make people second guess that status. And I think the same thing for Xi. When he came into office, as when Hu came into office, there was hope among liberals in China that there was some indication that they might be people who would sponsor <coughs> more wide-ranging reforms. Before Hu became president in, in 2002, when he was head of the Central Party School, he had there were studies in the Central Party School that looked really ambitious and really liberal. And the assumption was, since he was the president of the school, he must have authorized it. Well, he didn't read them when they were done, because uh, he never did anything that, that uh, would indicate that he was really a reformer, but was waiting for the opportune moment. Um, she has continued the more repressive atmosphere that began at the end of the Hu Jintao era. Um, you could argue, as this is more what we refer to as cocktail talk than really academic discourse, you could argue that he is setting things up, showing that he's really tough, he's willing to be repressive, so he's got credibility among other hardliners to make it easier for him to loosen up later. Or he really wants to be repressive, and so he's doing what he wants to do. Uh, we may not know, but there's nothing in his background uh, from previous positions, previous posts that he's held, to indicate that he's any different from what he's showing us now. So in that sense, um, I don't have much hope that he is going to be anything like Zhang Jingguo in Taiwan. Um, although I will say, not many people expected Zhang Jingguo to be Zhang Jingguo in, in yeah. either. So uh, a lot of people saw him as being the head of the security apparatus, and all the bad things were his responsibility too. So he was not exactly seen as, you know, for decades before, or not, I think for years leading up to it, that here was a guy who was determined to make Taiwan truly democratic. Um, so, an, an ambiguous case, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any uh, more questions before I, uh, I head back to Charles? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Jan, uh, and then uh, the, uh, Theo. I was wondering, to what extent does increased uh, tourism or travel, individual tourism from China to Taiwan matter? I mean, does it matter politically, or is it so, so small that, uh, that the CCP remains pretty confident about this? <coughs> well, it's really growing. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I'm ahead with the numbers, but certainly the opportunities to travel to Taiwan have certainly been growing. Um, um, and I don't think there's been any study, that I'm aware of at least, about how public opinion, public attitudes have changed by the people who have gone there. Um, so, you, you know, that was part of, I'm going off on a tangent, part, part of the U.S strategy for bringing about change in China was to let lots of tourists come here, let lots of students, not here, to the United States, I forget where I am, um, come to the United States to live, to study, to work, whatever else. They would then get infected with the democratic virus, and then they would go home, and it would spread. Um, the problem is that many of them did not go home. Um, because once they got to the United States, they wanted to keep enjoying what they'd been enjoying. The people who did go home were often very disillusioned by their experience in the United States, uh, did not have a very happy experience, and didn't go home with warm and fuzzy feelings about the United States. Um, and I think the people who, the tourists who have gone to Taiwan, uh, like the tourists who have gone to the U.S. or other places, um, <coughs> 
often go back having enjoyed the experience, but not, don't carry back the idea like, well, how come they have it so good? Why can't we have it like that? Uh, like the time of presidential, when Taiwan has a presidential election, it's often followed in China, but I haven't gotten a sense, well, people in Taiwan get to elect their leaders, how come we don't get to do that? It, it, hasn't, it hasn't led to that kind of, of reassessment, uh, which is surprising, because you'd think, well, you know, these are two Chinese societies. Um, why don't they draw inspiration from it? But they don't seem to. I, I don't have a good explanation for it, but um, there, at one point there are people who are arguing China should democratize because that would make it more likely to unify with Taiwan. Um, but that quickly went nowhere because this is like an awful high hurdle uh, in order to achieve unification. Um, so even that, that notion <coughs> that, that one of the advantages of becoming democratic would be to enhance the prospects for unification, I haven't heard that mentioned in, in, in a long, long time. Um, so whatever reason is, it, it just hasn't been uh, an inspiring case for people in China. But I think that's definitely a great topic for a, a, a PhD. It really is. <laughs> it really is. And I know they're starting to do research on uh, Taiwanese perceptions of Chinese tourists. Yeah. Oh. Institute of Sociology are doing that kind of research now. And it's not a very flattering picture. <laughs> and no, actually, I mean, that was the one of the things when Chen Zhilo was talking about this topic in December, and one of the things he picked up was how um, female respondents, no matter what their party identification was, had very <laughs> negative perceptions of Chinese tourists. So there was a, a really clear male-female divide rather than a partisan divide on that yeah. um, issue. key point because the international community, the things the international community is doing in a political sense towards China is not really advantageous if you want to give them more confidence at initiating democratizing <coughs> reforms. Um, the, the fear of the rise of China, what it means for American security interests, or Western interests more generally, uh, both in Asia and around the world, uh, there's almost a hysteria about it. It's one of the, nowadays, uh, about the only international issue that resonates with voters in the United States. It's very easy for uh, politicians to run sort of anti-China ads without having to apologize for them afterwards. Um, uh, so there's this notion that, that China's a threat, we should face up to that threat, we should be tougher on China, which is the opposite of what was happening in Taiwan in, in the mid-80s, where the threat from China was moderate, was getting less severe, uh, less likely that China would actually attack. You know, when, when the U.S. is pivoting towards Asia and when its, its neighbors are in conflict with China and territorial issues, you know, we can argue about whether China's the cause of many of those things, but nevertheless, the international environment looks pretty threatening. Um, and so, that being the case, it, it's kind of hard to imagine how uh, leaders would, would be more inclined to be ambitious in the sense of political reform, knowing that they're facing um, uh, large powers, as well as local regional powers, we're not really fond of what's happening. Um, telling American politicians they should take a more moderate tone towards China as a way of encouraging reform, that ain't going to happen. They're, they're not going to be influenced by that. Um, uh, but yeah, I think you, you, the implication of your question is, is right, that the more hostile the environment looks, the more you know, <laughs> benefits hardliners who say we're up against a very threatening system, they're out to get us, you know, they're promoting color revolution in China, they're promoting internet access, all these things are done to undermine our control. That's a powerful argument to make and, and the signs that in fact the international communities are looking to cooperate with China on a variety of issues, it's harder to make that case. So I think the international environment facilitates 
hardline reactions domestically and abroad, which runs contrary to uh, trends that would lead towards more political opening. Okay, on that note, I think we're going to have to um, uh, finish uh, there. Let's give um, uh, at least one more. Minute.